In this set of lectures, our aim is to give the background needed to define and understand the formulation of the optimal filtering problem and how we can solve it in an efficient manner using knowledge of Bayesian statistics. That is, we will define and discuss the underlying modeling assumptions. We will use a tool called Bayesian networks to illustrate how these assumptions affect the dependencies and independencies of our stochastic variables and how we can use this to make convenient simplifications of our problems. Lastly, we will show how we can use all this to calculate the posterior density for a fairly general problem family. To start off, however, I thought we put it all in a bit of context. What do we mean by filtering and how does it connect to the related estimation problems, smoothing and prediction? So what is filtering? Well, filtering is about recursively, which usually means at each time instance, estimating parameters of interest based on measurements. And these measurements can come from one sensor or multiple sensors. If they come from multiple sensors, we usually call it fusion or sensor fusion. But in theory, uh, it's basically all the same. And in this course, we will not focus so much on whether our measurements come from one or multiple sensors. If we know how to do it for one sensor, adding another sensor is in many cases trivial. To help us discuss the problem, we need to introduce some notation. So basically, throughout the course, we will let uh, xk, uh, indexed by uh, some time index k, uh, be a vector that contains the parameters of interest, and yk contain the measurements at time k. As sensors tend to deliver data at discrete times with fixed sample interval, time index k typically refers to one such interval, and thus it is a discrete time index. So using this notation, the filtering objective is to compute the posterior density of our state, xk, using what we denote as y12 k, where y12 k is a vector of containing all the data up to time k. And as we discussed earlier, if we can compute this, we can, for example, compute the mms estimate or the MAP estimate of xk using this posterior density. To make things a bit more concrete, let us look at some filtering or fusion problems in modern automotive applications. So modern vehicles today are equipped with several onboard sensors, and this could be radar, lidar, or camera, for example. We want to use noisy observations from these sensors to estimate a more refined view of the current traffic situation. Uh, so driver assistance systems in the vehicle then uses this refined view uh, to assess if there is any dangerous situation that we need to warn the driver of, or automatically intervene in order to avoid a situation altogether, or to mitigate its consequences. For a self-driving vehicle, on the other hand, this is the basic information that is used in order to plan a safe and comfortable path that the control algorithms in the car can then follow. Let us look at this example here, or illustration here, where we have a host vehicle that is equipped with a radar, and a camera. The radar will give us range, angle, and range rate to objects reflecting the radar signal. For example, this could be other vehicles uh, here, but could also be the metallic guardrail here. The camera, on the other hand, can detect and classify vehicles, but can also detect the lane markings on the road, for example. The information from these sensors is then used to estimate, for example, the current relative position and velocity of other vehicles, for example, we want to estimate where these vehicles are and where it's heading, and we can call this our state vector x1k for that vehicle, and then we have another state vector for this car, we call it x2k, and then for this car we call that x3k. What we also want to do is we want to estimate the current relative position and heading and shape of the current lane. We want to describe the geometry of our current lane like this. We call this LK. And this is crucial information if we need to plan a path that keeps the vehicle in its own lane, for example. Similarly, we can use radar reflections from the guardrail here to estimate relative position, heading and shape of the guardrail as well. One can think of many more things that we possibly would like to know, but in order for them to be classified as a filtering problem, it should be related to estimating the current value using data up to the current time. We want to use as much data as possible without introducing any lag. So filtering is, of course, not only used within the automotive applications. One of the first applications was related to finding the position and velocity of airplanes and ships for military purposes, which is still an active area today. 
Within control of physical systems, it's common to use filtering techniques to estimate interior states of the system in order to better control it. If we, for example, look at engine control, this could be estimating the angle of the crankshaft or the pressure in the piston in order to control the fuel injection. It is also quite common that you use filtering techniques to estimate things that you are not able to measure directly. And there are many such examples in an engine where it's hard to place sensors everywhere, but you can observe other things which relate to things that you're interested in and hence estimate it using those observations. And using the techniques you will learn in this course. One can also use filtering to assess the state in many other types of systems, such as biological and economical, for example. This could, for example, include estimating the diffusion constant of a dissolvent in a solvent, or the spread of a disease or the price of a commodity. There are two problems that are related to filtering, and that is what's called smoothing and prediction. The objective of all of these is to compute the probability density function of state xk, but they differ in how much data we condition on. So let us assume that we have a positive integer uh, that is greater than zero. In the smoothing problem, we want to compute the distribution of xk using measurements from 1 to k plus n. That is, we want to use future data at times k to k plus n to estimate a state at time k. In the prediction case, it's rather the opposite. Instead, we want to compute the distribution of our state xk using data from 1 to k minus n. That is, we are trying to make predictions of the state using all the data. The relation between prediction, filtering and smoothing can be seen in this figure here. In all the cases, we're interested in knowing the state at time k. We have not yet received so many measurements. We've just received measurements up to k minus n, but would anyway like to say something about the state at the future time k. When it comes to filtering, however, we have received all the measurements up to time k, and we want to use all of these measurements to estimate the current state. And lastly, smoothing, we have received more measurements, so we have received measurements up to time k plus n, and we want to use all of these observations to also improve our knowledge about the state at time k. So let us look at some examples of prediction and smoothing. Well, let us first look at examples where we use smoothing in automotive applications. Many autonomous vehicles use detailed maps to position themselves and to navigate. These maps typically include detailed geometry of the lanes and intersections, as well as position of traffic signs and pedestrian crossings. Uh, one way to construct these maps is to collect sensor data from many vehicles that are equipped with sensors that can give a course information about the position of the vehicle, for example, the normal GPS system, as well as sensors that detect and measure, for example, lane markings. By collecting data from all vehicles that have traveled a certain road, it's possible to jointly estimate the vehicle's trajectories as well as the map. So example is that you want to use the information from the camera sensor at each time instance here to accurately estimate the global position, heading and shape of all lanes. So we want to store in the map a global map of all the lane markings. It can also include the global position and shape of the, the guardrails, so a description of the guardrail. We can also include the global position of signs and what type of sign it is uh, using image classification to detect the sign type and using radar and or LIDAR to get its position. As we're not interested in having our estimate as fast as possible, but rather interested in using as much information as possible to make the map more detailed and accurate, we can allow ourselves to wait and collect as much data as we can before we need to compute our densities. Other examples of smoothing applications are, for example, surveillance at airports, where it's important for safety reasons to estimate the position of people and bags and so forth, but without having a strong real-time requirement. Here we are typically more interested in getting an accurate understanding of what has happened, and we can allow ourselves to collect more data in order to be more certain and accurate. Other examples include communication systems, where we typically receive a complete message before we want to decode it. And by decoding it, we mean basically mean that we want to estimate the message that was sent. In sports, we, we want to, for example, use a Hawkeye system in tennis to determine if a tennis ball was in or outside the, the line. And we do this after the fact by estimating the trajectory of the ball using a complete set of images. Other examples are in medicine, where 
we use a sequence of arterial blood pressure to estimate the intracranial pressure. Also here, it's more important to be accurate than timely. Now let's look at when we are solving the prediction problem, and again we start with automotive applications. So both our advanced driver assistance systems and autonomous vehicles need to make predictions of the traffic situation in the near future. When, for example, uh, planning a, for a safe path or assessing collision risks. And in both these cases, we need to have an understanding of what will happen in the future in order to take appropriate actions now. And as we do not have any observation of the future yet, we need to rely on predictions. So, for example, we would like to predict the relative position and velocity of the other cars. So we want to know where these cars will be in the near future in order to assess if we're going to collide with them or in order to plan a path ahead. We also would like to know relative position and heading and shape of the current lane, such that when we plan a path here in the future, we can stay within our own lane. And similarly, it's interesting to know where the guardrail is also in the future. When it comes to predictions in other applications, one example that most of us are familiar with is weather predictions, right? We want to predict the winds and pressure and temperatures for the coming days. This also illustrates that it's always harder to do predictions than filtering or smoothing where we have access to more data, right? So it's hard to make these type of weather predictions, at least in Sweden where I live. We have also other examples in economy where the management of companies relies on forecasts of, for example, the demand of their products in order to make decisions. And in politics, many decisions are based on predictions regarding population growth and the financial markets and so on. So these are all examples of predictions that we do. So here is a self-assessment question for you to check your understanding of the difference between these related problems.